This is a dubbed post-production intro. I uh, apologize for uh, uh, audio difficulties on the night of the reading. Um, Jennifer Lesh was born in San Bernardino, California and has lived in and around Portland for the past seven years. Her work was has previously appeared in Eclectica, McSweeney's Internet Tendency, Exconnect and other places. The poems she read at the 2010 Wordstock Festival can be found in the latest Voice Catcher anthology available at Powell's Books. She's a founder mem founding member of Portland-based writing group The Guttery and is a former Pushcart Prize nominee and writer in residence for New Light Studios in Beloit, Wisconsin. Um, uh, now we'll begin Jennifer's reading, and once again I apologize for cutting off of uh, a couple of lines of her first poem. Um, so here's Jennifer. The way she made it sound, it had been your cousin first, and while you were still hanging out to dry, his nine dirt-eating friends. The way Leslie told it, you had potions and spells to bring those red X's back to the pages of your calendar. Leslie said, you'd been caught with a carrot, that ruddy man of such thirst behind the girl's gym. And your sister, she'd been there with knobby cuke in hand. When it first happened to you, your chunky girl legs spreading on hay bales, on twisty Laura Ashley sheets, on cellar floors, on McDonald bags and oil rags. In someone's back seat, Leslie said, pop went the world. The way Leslie told your story on that summer day as we grip dappled horses between our lily thighs. She burned you right into the leather belt of my mind so that I flayed myself with your image ever since. So that when someone says whore, you stand up somewhere within me, your chunky girl face serene as you take a deep and satisfied bow. You guys can let me know. Oh, it's all right. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> I'm actually a little bit hearing impaired, so to me, the world comes through muffled anyway, so it's helpful to know. <clears throat> this one's called Love Like a Rash. October evenings at the airport, my father worked late under the swing of the beacon that blue, that white, because it was dangerous for me to run free on the grounds, full of snakes, jackrabbits rangy with rabies, I spent my after-school hours tucked safe but ignored in his office. Voices scratched over the radio, arranging flight patterns, safe passage across the rusted blue, Permission to land on the runway beyond the long window, out where tumbleweeds blasted themselves, scattering seed. These voices made me shy, strange men wanting answers. I'd turn to the typewriter, its ribbon smelling of copper, and pound, force too many keys to ascend from their orchestra pit the tangle of metal with metal. 
or I'd hide in the storage closet among mop handles and vats of Windex, its steel ladder alluring, rising to a small black window, the attic. Rung after rung, fingers curled like eagle's toes. I lifted my own weight up, bootstrapping it, felt a tickle of fear as the black opened above me, a snake that curled at the base of my spine. I knew enchantment in the attic crawl space, a half-forgotten murk that could mute plane engines, where the pine beams smelled raw and were gnashed by nails. My carpet was insulation laid thick, pink as cartoon panthers or Pepto-Bismol. How could a girl not be drawn to such stuff, want to take it to her lips like cotton candy, or twine it about her fingers, stroke her cheek like a powder puff? And even as my father called me down the ladder, his voice crossed with, Never trust a child to entertain herself. Even before the blisters would appear, like love bites on my jawbone, my neck, my inner arms, something would rise in me bigger than any fear. A rage to love what is lovely, what only hints at harm. Asbestos spun glass. Angel's hair. And this poem is an older piece that I recently rediscovered. Um, and it actually won a Valentine's Day writing competition um, back probably in like 1996. And all I remember about the little contest is that I won a hundred dollars and a box of chocolates. <laughs> so, with Valentine's Day on its way, here we go. Venus looks coldly over her shoulder. I dread morning, wanting only to lie back in the wire cold night with the boy who lives in the house beyond. But my feet wear sandals made of cement, and my eyes, faded of paint, gaze over my shoulder and past my love as though I cannot see him. Each night he comes to my garden, lifts the heavy heads of roses, oblivious as I twitch my heavy robes aside, exposing a breast by uncertain magic. But what would he want of such a breast, chill as a store-bought egg, skin austere as a grave marker, worn smooth by rain and years? And then, as dawn intrudes, her sticky fingers pulling him out of the rose beds and onto the path, I have no arms to console myself with, nor can I turn my head past the rise of my own shoulder to watch him go. And this poem is um, something that I refer to as a Frankenstein poem. Um, it's a, a much older piece that, you know, I probably wrote it like 12 years ago, and I thought it was really good. And I recently rediscovered the poem, reread it, and realized it was not so hot. So I took the poem and I reworked it, um, kind of did a remodeling job, um, a facelift, I guess top to bottom, and came at it from hopefully a more mature perspective. Um, you know, some of the stories, the people that are in the poem, 
their stories continued over the 10 or 12 years. So um, this is what I got. When the aquarium became unbearable, he moved out and I was left with these fish I'd never even wanted in the first place. A school for the wayward, a ragged danio, a glassine catfish, a placosimus, like the heel of a run-down prehistoric shoe. The tank's light was burnt out, so these captives drifted and dove in the darkness through their plastic forest, scudding gravel the color of their dull bellies. I didn't and couldn't know if they had real thoughts, if they could feel the change of ownership like a ripple that make their, made their cold hearts swell with fear. Yet the power filter's hum was a small comfort, familiar to sleep to, something to wake to, wrapping me almost like arms. I kept at it briefly, the business of owning and caring for the tank, but its wall-eyed orphans begged more attention than I could give. The water stank like Pike's Place Market, if it had been abandoned in some unspecified apocalypse. I thought, I wasn't meant to be a mother at such a young age, or perhaps ever. Finally moved from apathy to action, I dragged a net that shimmied like a drowned woman's stocking. I hunted the fish who were surprisingly wily and unwilling, even mulish but finally caught, dropped into a Pyrex bowl of their native water. They flipped and jostled and looked as concerned as fish are capable, given their lack of eyebrows. Kelly agreed to adopt. She was married, seemed stable, shared a one-bedroom flat with the childhood sweetheart she divorced later who has since died young, young being relative, once we passed that certain milestone, the death of someone who was formerly older than us, whose heart stopped while playing indoor soccer at 38, who's now younger than us, who dared teeter at the edge of middle age, then veered and avoided the fall. The notice of his death came in a cold ripple across the net and into each of our inboxes, news unwelcome as a virus and just as readily shared. And as for the fate of those three fish, in case you're wondering, I really don't know. But to get back to the day of the aquarium, I drained it with a hose I fed out my second story window a quick suck on the end, and 30 gallons fell in a stinking arc for what seemed like hours, but was probably minutes. I felt proud and accomplished, alone and brave and devil-may-care. I still had to call a friend over to help me move the tank. We heaved it to the window seat, stopped to rest this impossible load of glass Rocks, wet sand, filter plates and tubing, plastic plants fallen over like a forest after a landslide. As a joke, we edged the tank halfway out the window, paused at the ledge, gasped, and I can't really tell you what inspired this, but we pushed it over. The fish tank fell and fell in the dusk, became a shatter of shards, a brilliant commotion. We laughed, bent over, we thought we'd break in two, and we are laughing still. The story, if stopped now, lets us congratulate our young selves, such rascals, such rogues. So I always hold back the epilogue because it's not funny. 
How I waited for a week for something more to transpire. For the gardeners to stumble upon my dump site of glass. For the landlady to post a letter of eviction on my door. For my lost love to come back and see the mess I'd made and realize life is short and comic and better spent laughing by my side than walking away. But what happened was nothing much. I trudged outside dragging a garbage bag like a crumpled shadow of sadness. The next door neighbor watched me toil, clucking her tongue. Before she realized I could actually hear her, that I was a real person too. Not just another cliche that stops short like punctuation or death. But not much more than a kid who's just learning how loss can be ridden like a wave that can take her all the way crashing into now. This one's called Obsidian. Trucks brought sand for the new track at the schoolyard. And afternoons, I walked the smooth oval mile on mile. And wonder of all, found mixed in the grit, obsidian scattered like Satan's toenails. Examined closely, each chip had a whirl like a fingertips map. Pressed to the eye, it smoked the sun. I gathered glass fiercely, tucking the pieces in my breast pocket where they jostled, brittle in the keep. I ducked and seized, stooped and plucked, rose up triumphant, toes to the hinge that kept my shadow from flying away. A nun watched me from a classroom, a finger poised above the dial of her telephone. She had yet to interrupt my mother's day to warn of a daughter's strange habits. I had yet to learn to observe myself from the outside in, my eye trained upon this disorderly disorderly cosmos with its star that wavers, blinks out reappears. This poem was originally published in something called the California Poetry Calendar, which is probably now defunct, but was a really cool effort at the time. Um, And I'd have to look it up, but I I think I was Miss October. (laughs) Why my father smoked. I never knew why my father smoked, but I remember it was a time when I could do no better than sit at his feet before the television, watching the tobacco in his pipe glow. His forehead was steep as the slope of God through spice smoke and the blue of the evening news. Just before he'd shake open a newspaper and block me from sight, he'd blow me a ring, two, three, fat as hoop skirts. And as these dissolved into my laughter, my father would slide slowly into the silence of important words and men. And this one is called Hollow. It's got an epigraph. Come fill the God-shaped vacuum in your heart. And that was a sign outside of Bakersfield, California church. And tonight I have this rain, 
Have it like Mardi Gras beads twisting against the neon. Have it dark as jet against one burnt out letter O. Thunderously cold, a dead eye. And tonight the worms have stormed these cement pathways. And tomorrow they will turn in on themselves and die. In the winter sun, they will bake and blacken into wedding rings of spent sorrow. And tonight I have these lips that quiver against pale, so red, a knife drawn against bread that miraculously bleeds. Tonight I have a mouth that hoops itself into a sigh, a tongue that whips teeth in a parody of flagellation, but is unable to speak. What I want to say is that it takes a void to inspire songs for angels, a vault to urge a voice to its heavenly vibrato. What I want to say is that it's the new year and I am still unkissed at midnight. What I want to say is that even in the midst of grim abundances, I am without you, you who have become my god of the hollow, my prince of thin spaces. Thank you, everybody.